Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Underground. This is the Intel update for Wednesday, the 15th of March, 2023, and as always, it is being recorded the day prior on the 14th. So let's get right to it. Right up front, I wanted to kind of summarize the suspicious deaths that we've seen in the first quarter of 2023. So there's probably not too much Intel value with kind of tracking these sort of things. So historically, I, I haven't really bothered too much because, you know, these, these kinds of things just seem to happen whether or not we, we keep an eye out for them or not. But there have been quite a few lately, so I thought it might be interesting to kind of keep an eye on these uh, as we move forward. One new addition to the list this time, and that is Dana Hyde, uh, who was killed on the 3rd of March under very suspicious circumstances. Uh, the official story is that uh, she and her family were transiting back uh, via a private plane uh, to their home, and the plane experienced severe turbulence, and she died as a result of that severe turbulence. So, again, you guys can do a lot more research on your own. Uh, the rabbit hole on all of these uh, suspicious death cases is very, very deep, but I do find it very very interesting that a lot of powerful people or people with powerful connections uh, seem to be meeting a very untimely fate lately. So again, I thought it prudent to kind of keep an eye on this for now. Moving on to the Northeast region, there's really only one item of note that I wanted to focus on, and it's not something that I would normally mention or bring up. It seems like it's a simple, simple accident, and that is a traffic accident that occurred with a Sheets fuel truck, which overturned on a highway uh, just outside of Baltimore. Again, it's pretty horrific for a fuel truck to overturn and catch fire and explode and uh, it, it's a pretty kinetic event uh, and obviously the the driver of the truck uh, was killed in the explosion and the reason that I wanted to mention it is because this occurred on a stretch of highway in which homes uh, residential homes were impacted so this apparently is an area of a stretch of highway that locals have been trying to get some kind of barrier some kind of median that protects their homes from the highway and unfortunately this fatal accident proved that the residents were in fact correct that they did need some kind of protection from the highway because this truck crashed into their homes and started a very large residential fire as a result of a fuel explosion. So, again, this is just a very strong reminder to keep an eye out for things like this because, again, it, when these large industrial accidents occur, either, you know, a sim what seems to be a simple traffic accident or a large-scale industrial accident, there are almost always signs and indicators leading up to the incident. So, to me, this is yet another constant reminder that we should always be on the lookout for these kinds of things because as I mentioned and have been mentioning for literally years now when things are very tense out there in the world things tend to compound at the worst possible times right Murphy's Law is most certainly working overtime these days and speaking of Murphy's Law it has most certainly been a very kinetic couple of weeks for the American Southeast first of all one of the more uh, social I should say issues uh, that has kind of gotten a lot of press has been the uh, Antifa attack on a law enforcement training compound just outside of Atlanta. Not a whole lot of details about this. Usually, the only reason that I'm kind of interested in these kinds of events now is that these kinds of groups, Antifa, you know, groups like that, tend to only show up these days when they receive an awful lot of funding. So this facility, this law enforcement training center that is, you know, under construction slash partially operational now, I guess, has been a hot button issue in the area and really throughout the whole state for a very long time now. This is this is an issue that's several years running, right? And there have been protests there before. However, when, whenever we see dozens and dozens of Antifa guys show up, it's not like uh, that's a an organic protest, if you know what I mean. There's, there's a lot of uh, funding considerations that are most certainly coming into play when you see large, you know, conflagrations at, at facilities like this. So, when I see something like this, you know, when the mainstream media picks it up, uh, I just think, okay, they've got some more funding. Somebody wanted to make this happen on that particular day, so they made it happen. Moving back to more industrial infrastructure concerns, in North Carolina there have been two incidents worthy of note. Uh, the first of which occurred way back on the 13th of February, which I forgot to mention, uh, but this was a very very large fire at the National Salvage Facility in Goldsboro. So this is a facility that processes, recycles, and manufactures railroad ties. You know, those big creosote wooden railroad ties. So something that is extremely extraordinarily flammable uh, when stored uh, as they have been stored at this facility. So that fire uh, burned for quite a while. Uh, it's unclear as to how this is going to affect the you know, National Railroad tie supply. Uh, probably not very much. Uh, the facility is a fairly large facility, if I remember correctly, but uh, I don't know how much the fire impacted things uh, and how many railroad ties were consumed. Just thought it was worth mentioning this because this facility has ties to the railroad industry. More recently in North Carolina, on the 8th of 
March, there was an industrial fire which prompted evacuations in the town of Madison, North Carolina. It looks like the fire started in a liquid asphalt tank at an asphalt manufacturing facility there, uh, really kind of in the middle of Madison, North Carolina, which resulted in evacuations slash shelter in place uh, orders for the local population. So again, Madison is a very small town in North Carolina, and anytime you see large scale kinds of issues like this, it's very interesting to take note of. And wrapping things up for the southeast, we have two uh, railroad incidents, one in Alabama and one in West Virginia. Now before we go on, uh, with regards to railroad incidents, there have been a lot more. Uh, a lot more that I'm not talking about because they're either smaller incidents or they are incidents that I don't think are necessarily worth mentioning because they're obvious accidents. Right now, because the railroad industry has got a lot of eyes on what's going on with regards to train derailments and maintenance and staffing and things like that, uh, a lot of people uh, are trying to spin the story by making it seem like, oh, we're just paying attention more, so these incidents are not on the rise, but uh, rather we're just seeing them more, so it seems like these incidents are happening more often, right? The Secretary of Transportation tried to tried to push this myth, right, that these incidents are not on the increase uh, and just that we're noticing them more, right? How many of you have seen in comment sections all over the internet, like, there are thousands of derailments happening every day? Well, yes, there are an awful lot of train derailings, however, there are very very, very few catastrophic derailings, as in when you see the entire train leaving the tracks and becoming a stack of Lincoln Logs somewhere in America. That does not happen very often. A single car slipping off the track here and there, yeah, that happens, but when it comes to entire trains being derailed or a substantial uh, amount of the train becoming derailed, that is most certainly on the rise around the country. So, with regards to the incidents that have occurred in this region, in Alabama on the 9th of March, another Norfolk Southern train derailed in Calhoun County. Now, th this one's interesting because, again, 30 cars derailed uh, from this incident. And this particular incident prompted the Association of American Railroads to issue an emergency advisory with regards to rail cars that have loose wheels. So there is currently, around the United States, a uh, an emergency advisory, I guess is how we should say it, with regards to train cars that actually have loose wheels, causing them to derail. So so far, it looks like around 675 uh, rail cars are affected nationwide, and a good chunk of those, I think a little over a third of those, belong to Norfolk Southern specifically. So again, do not believe the lies that are being pushed by the government and by local agencies and local media, in which they're trying to make it seem like these derailings are, are perfectly normal. No, they're not normal. The catastrophic derailings do not occur that often. There is a problem with the way that we count derailing incidents, because a lot of train cars actually derail and then re-rail. They correct themselves, right? And those are still counted as a derailing incident. So when you actually look at the statistics of what is counted as a derailing incident, you have to factor out those, those incidents that are more like a single car derailing or like the next incident which occurred in West Virginia. Again, derailing incidents are getting a lot of press and I wanted to mention this one because it was a different railroad, CSX this time, and this one was seems to me like it was a little bit more a little bit more in innocent, uh, because this derailing occurred as a result of a rock slide. So, once you get into the details of each specific derailing incident, you start getting a lot more clarity as to what's actually going on. For instance, this CSX derailing in West Virginia, uh, it was the result of a rock slide, right? It was rock slide on the track, train couldn't stop in time, train hit the rock slide, derails the train. Now, the train was very short, uh, it was only, you know, five or six cars if I remember correctly, and they were all empty, you know, of course, being a a coal train moving through West Virginia. So local press indicates that the uh, engineers on board suffered minor injuries and of course the train uh, caught fire. So there was a little bit of a diesel spill there as well. But again, we, we want to keep an eye on derailing incidents, but we also want to make sure that we're, we're giving the appropriate level of concern to different kinds of uh, derailing incidents. Of course, any time a train gets derailed, whether it's an accident or not, is a problem. Because again, trains are a finite resource, right? And they transport an awful lot of the cargo uh, around this country that we're that we need for basically daily survival so anytime a train derails especially a locomotive that's that's never a good thing however it's a it's a whole lot different when you have an entire hundred car long train derail and it just is just a catastrophic derailing like we have seen in Ohio so I think that's probably a good way to transition back up to the east central Midwestern region and address the situation in Ohio really the only details that I have found interesting regarding the East Palestine hazmat crisis have been uh, 
mention uh, the fact that the governor's office has confirmed that the Ohio National Guard Adjutant General, Major General John Harris, the guy that we mentioned last time, uh, shoved a reporter and kind of started that whole incident, uh, he's going to keep his job. Again, not particularly surprising because there are an awful lot of generals and even field grade officers in the U.S. military and National Guard these days that seem to be committing an awful lot of crimes and keeping their jobs as a result. So, again, not surprising. I did find it very interesting that websites like military.com and all of the Times, uh, the Army Times, has been slamming this guy, which is interesting because these are usually sources that are very pro-military and not exactly quick to pick up corruption and other kinds of scandals. But uh, even these uh, traditionally mouthpieces for the U.S. military, you know, media sources are saying what is going on because, you know, any normal person like, you know, you or I would be in jail right now uh, for shoving somebody, you know, publicly during a press conference, but this guy does it on, on television and, you know, nothing happens, I guess. So, again, very interesting that corruption seems to be a the flavor of the week when it comes to the East Palestine hazmat crisis. Moving over to other incidents in Ohio, there was another Norfolk Southern train derailment on the 4th of March. Again, another one of those catastrophic derailing incidents that was a major factor in, uh, like I mentioned, the Railroad Association issuing the warning regarding loose wheels on cars. Fortunately, this train was mostly empty uh, when it derailed. But again, these incidents, no matter how much they want to be swept under the rug, are very strong indicators of how vulnerable our critical infrastructure is. Also in Ohio, an explosion occurred on the 2nd of March at Emory Oleochemicals, uh, which was a unidentified explosion involving some kind of chemical. Uh, again, does not look very good considering the history of what's recently been going on with regards to explosions and hazmat, so I did want to mention it, but again, there are very few details regarding the explosion at Emory Oleochemicals. Other than the explosion happened, evacuations were ordered locally, and that's basically all we know. So we'll add this to the list of things that mysteriously have been exploding all around the country. Moving over to the West central midwestern region, some very interesting staffing changes have occurred at STRATCOM. This has been a very low profile event, but considering STRATCOM's recent media involvement, I found it very interesting that six high-level and mid-level commanders have been relieved of duty following the failure of inspections regarding nuclear weapons. If we look at our handy chart here, we can see the breakdown of the firings that occurred. As of right now, it looks like the commander of 5th Bomb Wing, uh, Colonel Hoadley, is going to keep his job. However, among his subordinates are where the firings took place, specifically the commander of the 5th Mission Support Group, and underneath him, the 5th Logistics Support Squadron, and of course, underneath that command, four unknown uh, officers whose names are being uh, kept from the public, presumably because they're probably uh, decently junior and probably still have uh, a, a long career in the Air Force left, so they didn't want to kind of trash these guys' names. Uh, too quickly, I guess. But either way, uh, two very public uh, firings have occurred at STRATCOM, and four mid-level commanders have been relieved of duty due to the, you know, questionable nature of what's going on with our nuclear security. Again, when it comes to anything regarding nuclear weapons and STRATCOM, we're never going to get the full story. However, I find it very, very interesting, as many of you can, can plainly see, anytime we have mass firings following an incident that in which STRATCOM gets put in the spotlight, like I don't know, maybe a Chinese spy balloon incident. Uh, I find it very interesting that we're going to conduct these firings now. So to kind of summarize, there are two main theories and two main possibilities for these firings. One is, it could be exactly what the DOD said. It could be these guys were fired and relieved from, from command due to failing uh, nuclear security things. They messed something up with regards to the storage or implementation of nuclear weapons up there at Minot Air Force Base. Or it could be resulting from something to do with the Chinese spy balloon incident. Again, this base was most certainly su surveilled uh, by the Chinese spy balloon, so it could be one of each. It could be something to do with the Chinese spy balloon, or it could be something to do with nuclear security. Either way, no matter how you want to slice it, it just never looks good to have mass firings among the personnel 
that are responsible for our nuclear weapons. Now, just to give a little bit of a backstory, there have been mass firings at Minot quite a few times before, specifically among the people uh, charged with maintaining the security of our nuclear weapons. So this is not exactly a new thing, but I do find it interesting that the timing of this occurred uh, just a couple of weeks after the Chinese spy balloon is no longer in people's news feeds. This is exactly the time period when we would expect firings to occur. Moving back to more industrial accidents, we have two more for this region, one in Nebraska, which was an industrial fire at a very heavily congested industrial complex in Omaha. Now, the reason I can't exactly tell you where this occurred is because uh, we don't really know. Uh, we don't really know the name of the business where the fire broke out. As a matter of fact, this is why this incident is worth talking about, is because even the fire department stated they had a hard time finding the fire because all of the companies in this little business park uh, did not have clear postings of their addresses. <laughs> there weren't that many road signs, there weren't many address markers or anything like that, so the fire department had a hard time finding the seat of the fire. So again, just another reminder for those of you who work in industrial facilities out there that, you know, clear marking of something as simple as an address uh, can result in a fire getting out of control, so just thought I'd mention that. And wrapping things up with Iowa, a grain elevator uh, exploded slash caught fire, uh, which was at a very large grain and uh, corn processing facility. So again, it's not something that's particularly rare. However, uh, I did want to mention it because, you know, grain elevator incidents at a time where food insecurity is very much a thing are something that we want to kind of keep an eye on. Moving down to the American Southwestern region, things have gotten way more tense along the border with Mexico. As many of you know, the violence along the U.S. Mexico border has been very escalatory over the past few weeks, and the situation has not gotten much better. One of the main incidents that has caught my eye has been the assistance that the American Red Cross has been giving to illegal immigrants as they make their way into the United States. I figured this story would get kind of buried, so I did want to mention it uh, just so Americans are aware of where their tax dollars are going. Uh, even though this is not particularly a new incident, the American Red Cross has been assisting illegal immigrants for, man, decades now, I guess. A very long time for sure. Uh, but I did find it interesting some of the documents that have been captured by either law enforcement or other federal agencies by immigrants as they make their way illegally into the United States. And it turns out the American Red Cross has been providing extremely detailed maps, field guides, all kinds of literature to assist Ill illegal immigrants with transiting through Mexico, through Central America, and into the United States. I found it very interesting the level of detail that a lot of these maps are giving uh, illegal immigrants as they make their way towards the United States. It's almost like the American Red Cross is, is dropping evasion charts, you know, by air. It's like like, man, the, these documents are very, very highly detailed and provide a lot of guidance for illegals as they make their way uh, to the United States. Of course, the American Red Cross says their mission is purely humanitarian, but, but you really have to wonder how humanitarian that mission is when you're seeing maps that are extraordinarily detailed such as these. But anyway, again, the, the border crisis is getting much more severe. Violence is escalating. Uh, cartel violence is escalating. And again, the Operation Lone Star mission seems to continue to be a no-win situation. Like I've mentioned before, it's kind of... I don't want to say stalemate, but it's like, it's just kind of a no-win situation. Uh, the soldiers down there on the border fighting this mission, they're being mistreated by superiors, and they're nothing more than a political pawn for politicians. However, at the same time, you know, it's it's a straight-up war zone uh, along much of the border down there. We're certainly way past the point where you could describe what's going on as an invasion. So, you know, what do you do? It's a garbage mission, nobody wants to support it, and everybody who does support it either gets underpaid or mistreated in some way. However, at the same time, what are you going to do? You know, so uh, again, the politics of, of the border mission and the crisis down there on the border, it's hard to separate the politics of what's going on with the ground truth of the kinetic situation down there. So again, I want to remind everyone that it's not simply just a political issue, and it's also not purely a military defense issue either. It's very much a blend of both, and I myself certainly do not envy anyone working down there because it's most certainly a hard mission in many ways. 
ways, both politically and militarily. So again, I just wanted to remind everyone that the situation along the southern border is not looking too great right now. And wrapping things up with the United States, I wanted to briefly mention what's most certainly a developing story, but that is the financial collapse that appears to be ongoing throughout Silicon Valley. I am sure by the time this video gets uploaded and out, more details will be available, but it looks like several banks as of right now uh, no longer exist. Several banks so far that have been tied with the tech industry have completely and utterly failed with the FDIC coming in and basically seizing all of their assets and kind of running the bank. Right now, this has caused several runs on many other banks around the country, and we're seeing long lines of people trying to get cash out of ATMs uh, among, you know, among banks that aren't even part of the banks that are affected. But again, right now we may be seeing the dominoes start falling uh, with other banks most certainly following suit here very soon. I don't want to put too much uh, emphasis behind this because I myself am not quite sure as to how serious this is. I think all of us, even those of us who don't have 16 degrees in economics, can quite plainly see that a financial collapse uh, of the Western world is, you know, coming. It's, it's going to happen one day. Like, it, it's pretty common sense, even among any people who have no background whatsoever in economics. It's quite clear to see that. The question is, what is it going to look like and how fast it's going to happen? I myself am most certainly an outsider to the to the world of economics. However, there is one thing that I just keep thinking about when it comes to basically the entire Western financial world, uh, and that is a situation that seems to be developing. Uh, economists, for, for better or for worse, I think for worse, but I guess that's debatable, tend to find themselves in situations where they can't see the forest for the trees. And what I mean by that is that somebody like like me, who has no experience in finance, can plainly see that there are huge gaping chasms of vulnerabilities with our financial infrastructure, right? And I feel like at times, or most of the time, uh, the economics world tends to ignore problems that are so big that it seems like the only way to solve the problem is to completely start from scratch. However, I just don't know how much this is going to spread, or if it's going to spread, or if this is an indicator of what's to come. I mean, I think we all basically have common sense on, you know, the impending financial collapse, uh, whatever that's going to look like, right? We've been preparing for that for years, but now that it may be starting to happen, I don't think anybody is really any closer to a solution. Uh, I certainly don't know what, you know, what to do when, you know, your bank no longer exists. You know, what happens when you go to take out money out of an ATM and it doesn't give you anything because your bank doesn't exist anymore. These are issues that have been in existence for longer than I've been alive, and I don't think anybody's any closer to any practical solutions, other than, of course, a total overhaul of our entire financial system. But again, that's <laughs> that's most certainly out of out of the hands of the average person out there. So for those of you who are concerned that the economy may be tanking uh, more so than it already has uh, already, I hear you. Uh, I, I share those concerns, but I, like most of you, I'm guessing, have no idea as to what to do about it. Of course, have contingencies in place, prepare as best you can, but man, I, I just don't know what's going to happen to the Western world when, the, uh, when reality catches up uh, to the make-believe that we've been playing with our financial infrastructure. So on that slightly depressing note, I think we'll call it a day. Uh, I don't have anything for the international community just yet. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about South Africa at some point, probably in the next brief. Hopefully, if I can get some more details uh, on what's going on in South Africa with regards to their the basically the failure of their electrical system uh, and the mismanagement of their uh, power grid over the past, well, I guess a few years. Uh, but more to come on that later because I think there are some lessons to be learned for the United States when things like that start becoming a norm here domestically. China is most certainly still on my mind, uh, so don't think I, I've pushed that to the back burner. Uh, I'm just kind of um, compiling resources and starting to make maps for the region. So as usual, ride right around invasion time every year. It's, there's a couple of times a year where invasions, uh, at least an amphibious assault, would, would actually be technically possible. And that is, the first time is right around now, and the second time is after summer, so uh, the, the, the beginning of fall. But again, we'll talk more about that once we get, get to it. Right Right now, again, the season for invasion is ripe. However, China is most certainly not ready. There have been no major mobilizations of forces domestically within China, and coastal defense uh, batteries are not on alert as far as I can tell. So again, we'll wrap back around to China once we have more to talk about. So again, that's pretty much all I have for today. Uh, thanks to everyone for watching, and thank you for your support over the years. I know it's been kind of rough out there. 
and it's only getting rougher. But we'll move ahead like always, and we'll keep doing the best we can. That's all we can do, I guess. Anyway, lots of other things in the background uh, that I've been working on. Uh, lots of other things the team here has been working on as well uh, with regards to things like communications and war kitchen stuff. So stay on the lookout for that as we move forward into the spring. So with that, thanks again everyone for watching, and we will see you next time. And as always, fight in the shade.